Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the insurance specialists at BrightThink Wealth Strategies. Find the disability insurance coverage that fits you best right now. Email Robert Smith at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. The show is also made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. We'd also like to thank Helping Hands and OSA EMR for their support of the show. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out the CE Credit tab on our website, beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. We know you spend your day caring for your patient's best interests. On our show, we want to care for you. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA industry. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Welcome to Beyond the Mask. I'm Jeremy Stanley, and I've been working with CRNAs for over 23 years, and I'm married to one. And my co-host is... Sharon Pierce. Sharon's a practicing CRNA for over 20 years, a past president of the ANA, the NCANA, and she's held many other leadership roles. As usual, our goal with every episode is to educate and enlighten CRNAs, and I think our topic today is definitely going to do that. And Sharon, what time is it? It's time to wake up, Jeremy. I think it is. Well, hello, Sharon, and hello to our listeners. How are you doing this morning, Jeremy? Of course, we're getting up to afternoon. I know, I know. Here we are in the studio again. Our favorite place to be. Favorite, yeah. It just sets a different tone when we're in the studio. Well, at least I can look at you across the way, (laughs) do hand gestures. Yeah, you know, that's always good. I never know what I'm going to get. You know, it's like a box of chocolate, you know. All right, Forrest. Uh, well, I think we've got another great episode planned for today, and it's another part of our historical series. Which people love. Let me tell they you, um, I was at the IFNA meeting in Croatia, and I had people, CRNAs from other countries. How about that? Yes, coming up and saying they love the historical series wow. because, you know, they are nurses who give anesthesia in a lot of countries. They're not called CRNAs. Only we, that's a, right. that's an American an term. Mm-hmm. It's an American term. And they love hearing how we got to where we are because mm. we are what they aspire to be. They want their practices to be like ours. Yeah. And so I had lots of people come up to me and tell me they love that's awesome you know series. when we started this we never had a clue that people would be listening to us in other countries no 125 of them yeah to be exact. i mean it's it's absolutely crazy but absolutely i was just crazy. i was just surprised that people came up to me as many times as they did and said they loved the historical series well it's yeah. not only you know nurses and nurse anesthetists around the world but i received a call and in fact talked to an anesthesiologist about the uh, podcast that Nancy and I did on Tefra. He was a delightful person. He had some questions. He had ordered the book, our Professional Aspects book, and he said Hmm. he really found it very informative, a lot of good information. And so it's not only the nurses, but the physicians are also listening. Well, I figured that anyway. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. The more the merrier these days. So we didn't introduce, but of course everyone knows that voice, Miss Sandy Ouellette and Nancy Marie. Welcome guys back to do the historical series. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad you're both here. Absolutely. And Sharon, who are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about Olive Burger. Is she kin to olive oil? I don't know. I don't know. Good question. I just come back from Italy. I ate a lot of oil, olive oil over there. Um, But, you know, I had never even really heard this name that much. So this is going to be interesting for me. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of early nurse anesthetists worked in academic medical centers and, and they were exposed to some of the best medicine and surgery of the day, right? Right. Um, And Olive was one of these pioneers of distinction, and she carved out her legacy at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and then at Boston's Children's Hospital in Boston. 
So today we're going to learn a little bit more about her. And Nancy, why don't you tell us a little bit about her early nursing education? Well, Olive Berger was born in Montclair, New Jersey, and she graduated from the from the School of Nursing at Roosevelt Hospital in New York in 1922. 1922. Wow. She could just got the right to vote. Yeah, she yeah. did. She did. She lived through the you know the Great Depression. Can you imagine living back then? You had your roaring twenties and then the Great Depression. Wow. Oh my! Boom and bust. Mm. Yeah. And she had her eye on anesthesia early on, didn't she, Nancy? Mm-hmm. She yeah. did. Uh, she completed her anesthesia training in 1922 at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She was named chief nurse anesthetist in 1931. So you're a student one day, you're a young practitioner, and then all of a sudden, wow, you're chief nurse anesthetist. Not that many years after she graduated, 1931. And she held that position until she retired in 1969. So she retired, Olive Berger retired from a long career, 38 years, the year I began anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And we both had a very similar interest, and that was cardiac anesthesia. As a young nurse anesthetist, I was uh, one of the few that worked in the cardiac room uh, in in the early 70s. And so I, I really am interested in, in her. And, you know, Sandy's heart test and anesthesia school were awful. <laughs> right. I still have PTSD from those things. <laughs> right. Um, so as chief nurse anesthetist, uh, she managed the anesthesia department. She administered anesthesia. And she educated. She trained at least four nurse anesthesia students annually. She was busy. She administered anesthesia for the first pneumonectomy at Johns Hopkins. And with Helen Lamb, developed an endotracheal technique for intrathoracic surgery. You know, they had to apply, begin to think about positive pressure ventilation. And they didn't have things like endotracheal tubes. That had to be developed. And remember, she was the one, Berger, the first pneumonectomy at Johns Hopkins. And as we previously said, it was Helen Lamb uh, that administered the anesthesia for the first pneumonectomy in in her particular uh, institution, uh, which was... St. Louis? Yes, St. Louis. Thank you. Um, but... Um, so she was the first nurse anesthetist to administer an anesthesia to infants for repair of Tetralogy of Fallot. And Berger gave credit to uh, Betty Lang at Children's Hospital of Boston for her contributions to anesthesia for patients with Tetralogy of Fallot as well. Because it was Betty Lang, and we will talk about her another day, uh, she was a star herself, uh, that used cyclopropane rather than oxygen and ether for these cases. So Olive Berger, her work highlighted uh, the work of surgeons and nurse anesthetists and techniques, mostly for uh, thoracic and cardiac surgery. Now, it was said that she worked with Dr. Graham and Lamb. I don't know that she actually worked with them, but probably collaborated with them, uh, talked with them about what they were doing. Dr. Beck and Gertrude Fife at... um, Cleveland, and Dr. Blaylock and Berger uh, for the repair of cardiac defects. She served as the first nurse to administer anesthesia for the famous Blue Baby operations Mm -hmm. that were pioneered by Blaylock, Tussick, and I always add Thomas as well, uh, that was developed in the 1940s. And uh, I asked Nancy to let me speak to this because I remember doing some of these procedures myself, mostly to get more blood to the lungs in children that were born with Tetralogy of Fallot. Now, isn't that where they enlarged the the septal Mm -mm. defect? Which one is that? Because I had a cousin who had that done. It's a subclavian to pulmonary artery shunt. Okay. It's what they do to get more blood to the lungs uh, past that uh, right ventricular outflow obstruction. See, y'all? You can just imagine the test. <laughs> right. Uh, so, <laughs> and she hadn't forgotten a darn that's, thing. No. That's right. No. Um, so this blaylock tussock thomas shunt was developed at the time for patients with cyanotic heart disease. And um, so it was called the blue baby syndrome. And it consisted of increasing blood flow to the lungs to alleviate that. The procedure was named after surgeon Alfred Blaylock. And Helen Tussick was a cardiologist. And Vivian Thomas 
was Blaylock's laboratory assistant. His name is often left off. But I'm telling you, if it hadn't been for him, mm-hmm. it would have never happened. Really? And I'll tell you uh, how that happened. Uh, so Tussock, the cardiologist, had noticed that children with cyanotic heart disease that had an open patent ductus arteriosus live longer than those that's ductus closed. And she felt that a shunt that mimicked a patent ductus okay. arteriosus might relieve the poor circulation that these patients had in a tetralogy of fallot. So she felt that the problem was they've got to get more blood to the lungs. If the ductus was open, it was blood coming from the, right, uh, you know, into the pulmonary artery. Mm-hmm. We got to, she knew they had to develop a shunt uh, to get more blood to the pulmonary circulation. And so she first went to Boston Children's Hospital and talked to the renowned surgeon Robert Gross, but it was without success, apparently, he, it just wasn't something on his radar at the time. So she later approached Blaylock and Thomas at Hopkins Lab in 1943. The report of the original consultation with the three is found in Vivian Thomas's 1985 autobiography, Partners of the Heart. Tussett carefully described the anatomy of a tetralogy of flow. You know, it's four things, mm-hmm. but made no suggestion Uh, about a procedure she just said there needed to be more blood into the lungs so Blaylock and his lab assistant Thomas that's what he was he was a high school graduate um, a a black man no formal education beyond high school worked on the procedure that they had done of joining a subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery they worked in the lab on animals with Thomas performing the procedure alone in 200 laboratory dogs. And he then adapted instruments that could be used for the first human surgery. And in fact, he coached Alfred Blaylock through the first 100 operations in these infants. Wow, well, I'm glad you're bringing him forward then. Uh Vivian Thomas. And you know, he was not Oh, it's a man named Vivian. Uh, Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's a man. Holy um, cow, a black man with no formal education. High school education only. In that day, in the 1940s, wow. who was the lab assistant, but sort of ran the lab. And when it came time to do this on the infants, Blaylock would not do it with unless that. he was his person right beside him in the operating room. That created quite a stir, as yeah. you can imagine. Hmm. How cool a story wow, is that? That is an awesome story. Yeah. And so his, this Thomas, his contributions experimentally and clinically were so critical that many believe that he should have been given credit for the procedure along with the other two. Hmm. But because of racial prejudice at a time and academic custom, which generally precluded mention of non-degree lab assistants, he did not have the honor of having the shunt named after him. Well, what's the mm. difference today? None. <laughs> right. <laughs> I and, mean, really? <laughs> so, yeah. But if you look uh, now and you Google some of this, and, and some people say Blaylock Tussock and some say Blaylock Tussock Thomas. And so, that, so that they are adding his name. And in 2004, there was an HBO television movie made entitled Something the Lord Has Made uh, based on writer Katie McCabe's Uh, 1989 article of the same name, which highlighted the role of Thomas in the historic Blue Baby surgery. There was been a documentary also made in 2003 named Partners of the Heart, and I think I saw that one. Oh my goodness, we need to say that again. Something the Lord has made, made, Yes, and Partners of the Heart. Heart. I love documentaries. Yes, and um, and it was really good. Especially since I'm in the middle of doing one. (laughs) Yeah, I saw one of the two of those, and um, Wow. And it was really very good. And I think that's why I'm so attached to sure. Mr. Thomas, because he was pivotal in this ever being done. And so getting back to Berger and her role in this, there was a journal article in the ANA Journal in 1948 in which she stated, there has been 480 anesthesias administered to 475 patients in this series. This was the Blue Baby Syndrome. In 41 cases... The anesthetics were administered by physicians. The remainder were administered by six nurse anesthetists. 
It has been the writer's privilege to administer 289 of these anesthetics. The youngest patient was four months old. The oldest, 45 years. Gosh, amazing they lived that long. 54 patients were over 20 years of age and four were over 30. Okay, now you got to answer. There have been 480 anesthetics administered to 475 patients, so five were bring back. That's right, that's right. (laughs) I was thinking the same thing. I know, I'm like, that doesn't work But But look at that total number, only 480 uh, 41 were administered by physicians. Isn't that yeah, less than 10 percent? What, yeah. what is it today? I mean, what is that yeah. statistic today? Does anybody know? I don't know. Don't huh. know. Compared but, CRNAs versus. But this was in the beginning when they didn't have pulse ox or right. Right. any of right. the uh-uh. fancy dancy stuff we have right. now. Now, in the archives, there's three old composition books, and um, it was unclear whether it's the ANA archives or whether. It's the um, Johns Hopkins, Hopkins. Mm -hmm. but uh, they're just old black and white composition books. You probably, two of you don't probably remember that. Oh, I had composition Uh, books like that. But it's on Mm -hmm. tetralogies, valvulotomies, and cardiac surgery. They include notes from first cases of surgical treatment of cyanotic congenital heart disease and the first lung and mitral valve operations at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, In many of these cases were managed with open drop ether. Well, well, the reason why I ask about that is because my I had a cousin who let's see, I was born in sixty three. God, did I say that out loud? And my he was born in sixty four, and he, you know, it's hard to know what was happening because uh, my parents were not medically inclined. But he clearly had tet squats because my mother would talk about him squatting all the time and he was a blue baby and he died when he was 21 months old and they my mother said they went in to make the hole in his heart bigger because Mm -hmm. they so it sounded like they were enlarging his vsd Right, VSD yeah, yeah, or, or either, yeah, or, or either trying to uh, to get the to cross create a uh, ASD. Right, they're trying to get more mixture of blood. Yeah, and he died. That could have been a transposition, but it sounds like um, it sounds like a tetralogy. Yeah, blood because was squatting. Would, mm-hmm. because what they do there is uh, that increases systemic vascular resistance, mm-hmm. and that decreases the cardiac right to left shunt, mm-hmm. and it decreases the hypoxemia. Yeah, and you know when they desat on the operating room table, we get phenylephrine. Which right, also to increases increase their systemic. SVR. Yeah, yeah. And, and what you're doing, the goal is, working back, to decrease that right to left, pouring that mm-hmm. deoxygenated blood mm-hmm. into the mm-hmm. oxygenated right. side mm-hmm. of the heart. Mm-hmm. And um, so, uh, but for them to be able to be doing these things then is just unbelievable. Yeah, so With, this must, he, he was probably operated on in 64, 65, mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. like that. So, and, and, you know, it was in Winston-Salem, I think, that yeah. he was done, not at Johns Hopkins right. or anything like right. that. Right, right, Yeah, so. so that was a little before my time in cardiac anesthesia I, uh, here I, in Winston-Salem. It was in 1970. As a CRNA, you spend years preparing yourself for this career, so we don't want to see you lose out on any of the income you've worked so hard to earn. The best way to protect yourself and give you the confidence that a major life event won't disrupt your financial future is through disability insurance. We've known disability income specialist Robert Smith for many years and have seen the work he's done with nearly 2,000 CRNAs over multiple decades. He can help identify any gaps in your existing coverage and fill those gaps by finding the best value on a policy. Contact Robert and let him know you heard about him on our podcast. Send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504-394-6557. Protect your greatest asset as a CRNA, yourself and your ability to earn a living by adding disability insurance to your financial plan. All right, so Nancy, who was Austin Lamont and what was his interest while working at Johns Hopkins? Well, at some point in all of this, Dr. Blaylock asked his surgical colleague, Austin Lamont, to make a study of the latest science in anesthesiology and to visit other institutions and bring the rest of the surgical team up to date. In other words, the surgical team at Johns Hopkins up to date. 
Lamont spent two years visiting institutions and worked with a first physician anesthesiologist. He concluded that anesthesiology should become a medical specialty. There you go. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> there you have it. Complete with residencies and fellowships, because evidently up until this time, that had not occurred. Hmm. Uh, he, what year was that? Do we know? I don't know, Sharon. Okay. we got to find that <laughs> out. Okay. Um he felt modern surgery required new approaches to anesthesia, and it was no longer, in his view, just a matter of dulling pain, but rather precise control of other vital systems while surgeons operated. So I guess he didn't think that Miss um, Berger and other nurse anesthetists did anything but dull pain mm. and didn't monitor their patients with what they had available. Uh, Lamont was with colleague Merrill Hamill, tried varying combinations of cyclopropane, ether, and nitrous oxide to keep patients anesthetized, but breathing, they wanted them to breathe. Holy cow. During the first 100 blue baby operations. Uh, And during the first 100 operations, 23 died in the OR or soon after. Mm. Olive Berger took over anesthesia duties for blue babies (laughs) procedures at at least she had done that by 1946. So I would assume this two years, and I don't know this, but I'm assuming this two years would have been in the early 40s, maybe. Mm-hmm. That yeah. would, okay, y'all got another job. Okay. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can tell, see that evidently things were not going too well, so Olive Berger took over the anesthesia duties for Blue Babies in 1946. Uh, Berger rejected Lamont's proposal for physician specialty in anesthesiology. She believed that nurse anesthetists were sufficient for the job. Uh, Lamont left Johns Hopkins for the University of Pennsylvania, where he helped make physician-led departments of anesthesiology the norm across the medical community. Hopkins joined the trend in 1952. Okay, y'all got another project right now. In 1952... Miss Berger was made an instructor in anesthesia in the School of Medicine in Johns Hopkins. So that was a, a tremendous honor for her. And she stayed. He left. <laughs> but she stayed. <laughs> That's right. And she stayed until she retired in 1969. Wow. So she was there for 38 years. That's right. All she had to do was outlive them. That's right. <laughs> wow. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Nancy, what was her role in the early years of a and Well, she served on the first education committee chaired by Helen Lamb, and we talked about that when we did the podcast on Helen Lamb. Uh, the recommended commission of the committee was adopted and published in 1937, and this was in the Bulletin of the National Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Oh, the recommended curriculum, mm-hmm. you mean? You mm-hmm. said commission. I'm sorry. Committee. It's okay. Uh, curriculum, excuse me. It's a C word. <laughs> it's, close. <laughs> it's, okay. it's close. Okay. She was also elected second vice president of NANA in 1935 when Hilda Solomon was elected president. And then uh, Berger served as AANA president in 1958 through 1960. And remember, that was when they, they served two-year terms, and NANA had been changed to AANA. Her presidential quote was, If you believe many members working together can accomplish more than individuals working alone, we'll find the enthusiasm necessary for group action. Olive Berger received the A.A. Hodgins Award in 1975. Well, y'all would have been there to see that. Mm-hmm. I was. Because I were... didn't miss many of the A.A. meetings either. Yeah. Do you remember that? So I, I don't remember. I remember 
Hilda Solomon when she mm-hmm. received an award. Okay. But I don't remember Olive Berger. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So Olive Berger spent her entire career navigating a highly political, charged, and contested space of practice. No which kidding. We can see. Yeah, I just want to figure out that timeline. I mean, another thing that we've always said was uh, physician anesthesiology didn't become kind of a profession till after world, world war ii two. we mm-hmm. know that but we again just like katherine lawrence don't know i don't know specific somebody like randy yeah. cornelius or somebody who does <laughs> a lot more research might might know that so collaboration with dr alfred blaylock facilitated enabled and enabled surgical advances as medicine grew more complex during the 1930s to, through to the 1950s, collaboration and interdependence, a term recorded by Thatcher in her history book, uh-huh. with physicians was an essential part of progress. Berger witnessed and participated in the transition of medicine and anesthesia from an art to a science, because prior to this, it was an art mm-hmm. because of the lack of monitors. I mean, you were the monitor. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't imagine keeping those little blue babies breathing during uh those procedures. Uh What skill that had to have taken to do that? Well, yeah, because they were just going by the signs and stages. I mean... Holy cow. And... I mean... And they had to know exactly how much ether to drop or not drop, you know? Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's something. Berger also incorporated advances in technology with the techniques and skills of nursing, and she contributed to the shape and form of our profession by her her willingness to go beyond the defined boundaries of nurse anesthesia practice of that time period. Nurse anesthetist breaking boundaries? Oh, what a (laughs) shocker. And, you know, there were others like, can you imagine going out to dinner? You're on the curriculum committee. Olive Berger and Helen Lamb, and you've worked on the educational piece all day, and now you're out to dinner, and they're talking about what was being done at Helen Lamb's a uh, hospital, and you know, and that they were collaborating, they were talking, they were putting things together, and um, and probably learned so much. And uh, we're going to talk about Betty Lang at Boston Children's Hospital on another day, and she was another one that mm. went beyond. And these were this was this was an unexplored world that these ladies were in and and they stepped to the plate you know you could see that the physicians did the first hundred of them and they weren't coming out too well 20 some died yeah (laughs) yeah and then i don't know exactly when the nurses began to do it but they did a whole lot probably after the ones died they go you know what we'll let y'all do it now (laughs) So, so i don't know but um and you know i would like to add in closing comments what nancy said we have the same pioneers today that are forging ahead and doing great things. For example, uh, Peggy Contrera at Cleveland Clinic now. Yep. She's in the cardiac area. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know Peggy. Yep. Um, but she helped standardize the transvenous aortic valve replacements that are being oh. done all over everywhere now. Mm-hmm. And I had the honor of writing a recommendation for her recently uh, to become a fellow uh, for oh, the yes. uh, for the um, Academy of, of um, Nurse Anesthesiologists. Uh, but anyway, with that, I said, you are the Olive Berger of today. How cool is and that? And I don't know others that are probably out there doing the same thing. Well, I just got an email this morning about a, an airway. I think a CRNA developed this airway, the McMurray Enhanced Airway. One, the Airway World Innovation some kind of award it looks pretty cool Mm -hmm. i mean we've all made contraptions like this yeah um with endotracheal see it's Mm -hmm. got the endotracheal tube Mm in into the nasal trumpet we've all done it i remember dale potter used to do that when i was in the anesthesia school 100 years ago but he they just made it into an airway and marketed it you know i mean we've all been doing doing rigging up stuff so so and getting back to what you said, when did it become more of a physician special? The numbers certainly grew mm-hmm. uh, after Medicare in right. 1965, wow. and uh, so All that was money. so that was there after World go. War II. But you know, even as a young anesthetist here and a student, 
There were no anesthesiologists. Our program was started by Dr. Wall, who was probably the first anesthesiologist in the state of North Carolina. And when Dr. Frank James came, Mm -hmm. and he later became a chair of the department, there well, that's because hand- he was the only one there. There, there right? wasn't but a handful yeah. of board-certified yeah. anesthesiologists in the state back yep. in, that, in that time. So uh, the numbers have grown, uh, but they really didn't get going until probably the 80s and mm-hmm. beyond, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of numbers. But, yeah, Jeremy's doing hand signals. <laughs> Show I'm just saying them. follow the money yeah. trail. Well, you know, wait, I, I heard Drew Riddle say something, and this needs to be your line now, Jeremy. It's pretty good. Uh, the answer's money. What was the question? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there you that go. That needs to be your new line. That's good. Line. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Olive Berger, a star in her day. Yeah. Yeah. Well. That was another good one. Sandy, Nancy, thank you for being here. It's always great to have you guys in the studio, especially. Sharon, think it's a wrap? I think so. Well, we want to thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mass with Jeremy Stanley and... Sharon Pierce. If you like our show and want to help us grow, Sharon, how can they help us grow? Well, the best way to help us grow is to leave us a review, but make it... Positive. Obviously, there's way too much negativity in this world. Absolutely. Tell all your friends, uh, share us on social media, and help us grow because we are in the top 50 medical podcasts in the United States on our way to number... Number one, of course. Absolutely. We're already number one in the CRNA community. Absolutely. Yeah. We, right. we just want to conquer the world. Well, yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> All right, until next time. It's a wrap. Have you thought about what would happen if you weren't able to work for two or three years? You know, on average, 25% of people will file a disability claim, and most of us aren't prepared for that loss of income. Every CRNA needs to protect their biggest asset, yourself and your ability to earn with a disability insurance policy. We recommend contacting Robert Smith, a master disability insurance specialist with more than 30 years of experience and 1,800 CRNA clients to find the coverage that fits you best. The best way to do that is to send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504 504- 394-6557. Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. OSA EMR is a free anesthesia EMR developed by CRNAs that you can download and use on an iPad. Our nonprofit mission is to make sure that solo and small practice CRNAs can digitally record their anesthetics. To learn more, visit OSAEMR.com to download and consider donating to our cause. Remember, for CRNAs, data is destiny. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site 
or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.